first person out here today is written down in my cheat sheet here. Uh, please, uh, Moriel Arango of Blade Runner Energy. It's going to be your turn to come on out here. Bla Blade, Ru Blade Runner Energy is an affordable energy solution that can help millions worldwide while reducing reliance on fossil fuels. I recently also learned that Muriel has, uh, he swam with pink dolphins and piranhas in the Amazon, so this shark tank should be a piece of cake. <laughs> so here's how it works, you'll have three minutes for your pitch. I believe there'll be a, t a, t a clock here, pay attention. If you don't, I will. <laughs> and after the pitch, uh, we'll have some time for Q&A. Muriel, good luck. Thank you. Whether you believe or not that climate change is a direct result of our dependence on fossil fuels, it is difficult to argue against the transition we are seeing worldwide towards more sustainable ways of satisfying our energy demand. As CTO and co-founder of Blade Runner Energy, I want to share with you how we are bringing to the table a solution that will help to displace the use of fossil fuels and will strengthen the stance that has been taken by certain renewable energy systems. We are developing a technology that will harness the power found in the natural flow of water without the need for a dam. Here in the Pacific Northwest, it is easy to see the resource we are after. We have numerous rivers and streams with healthy flows. We have thousands of miles of irrigation canals, and we have thousands of miles of coastline subject to predictable tides. Our fish-friendly system can tap into the renewable energy that is found in these natural waterways, and it can harness power that is purposely being dissipated in the irrigation canals. Our vision is comprehensive. We will get our system into the hands of microgrid and remote off-grid communities that live in close proximity to these bodies of moving water, and we will also service the outdoor living community with a focus on sailboats. For these market segments, our competitive solution will represent a reliable source for baseload power. Currently, due to the intermittent nature of solar and wind, it is standard practice to rely on diesel generators to satisfy this baseload demand. Our approach is unique. We are integrating an IP protected rotor that is inspired by nature. Its elongated profile will allow for deployment in shallower water. We are using a flexible tether to transfer the power from the rotor to the generator, which improves the survivability of the system in the presence of large debris. And we are using off-the-shelf electrical components, which at the end will result in a solution that is more affordable. To date, our team has received close to $1 million for technology development from the National Science Foundation. With this money, we will have our minimum viable product ready for launch by the first quarter of 2019. Today, I am here to ask for your support. The money from this early stage award will jumpstart our efforts to commercialize our product, and it will help us succeed in having one of our first pilot demonstration projects happen here in Central Oregon. I want to thank EDCO, the Ben Venture Conference, and all of you for this fantastic opportunity to share our vision. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Muriel. Very well done. Appreciate that. So I'm going to turn to the panel for some questions, and audience will be thinking of your questions as well. So can you, can you talk to us a little bit about how much power you can create with your solution, and then what is the total addressable market? I mean, how, how big of a business can this yeah. actually create, considering you need some kind of moving water for the power to be generated? So our minimum viable product is going to be a 500 watt system. So this small scale prototype is 8 inches in diameter. Our MVP is going to be 20 inches. With 500 watt, if you were to put that into a location with a reasonable moving f flow of water, you have a capacity factor of say 33%. That would be equivalent to roughly 16% of the average American household. Um, but we're going to scale our system from 500 watt, 1 kilowatt, 2.5 kilowatt. 2.5 kilowatt would be sufficient 
to almost satisfy the demand of a, of a whole house in the US. Now, our vision is to go elsewhere as well. Now, in terms of the potential that exists, if we look at the United States, so not until 2012 did we have an idea of what resource was available. Technically recoverable, as defined by EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute, we have 120 terawatt hours per year. That is enough to satisfy the electricity demand of 11 million households in the US from rivers alone. If you look at tidal, it's enough to satisfy the demand of 25 million homes. Pacific Northwest, we have 10% of that technically recoverable potential. Alaska has 20%. In Alaska, 50% of the population relies 100% on diesel generators. And it takes one minute to look in Google Maps. 260 communities relying 100% on diesel. They all live right next to a river. They all live right next to a tidal basin. Uh, th thanks, that was, that was great. I want to actually expand on uh, Adam's question and talk about the demographics of your total addressable market and um, the fact that you've highlighted underserved communities, et cetera. I think you could maybe make the case that some of those communities are tough to access. Mm -hmm. So can you guys talk about your broader strategy on how you actually get the product to some of those remote communities that may not have access yeah. to? Uh, so in order to gain traction in those communities, so the remote communities, the agricultural communities, irrigation districts, those are hard markets to get into. So we need money, unfortunately. <laughs> but the way we're going to make the money... You're in the right spot. Yeah. <laughs> the way we're going to get the money is from you guys now. Uh, we're going after the sailing community. So in sailboats, you have a diesel generator to feed the juice into your battery bank. Sailors, sustainable sailors, are employing solar panels, wind turbines, but due to the intermittent nature of those resources, they still find themselves in the morning when they go to brew their coffee that they still have to turn on their generator. A 500-watt system would satisfy all the power that a 38-foot sailboat would need. And our system is rated at 3 meters per second, which is equivalent to 10 feet per second, which is equivalent to a little bit under six knots. That is very much cruising speed for all sailboats. So with one of these in a reasonable size sailboat, they'd be able to satisfy all the amp hours that they need, and they'd probably have to even dump some of it. So, Can you talk a little bit more about your marketing plan and your distribution strategy? So. In order to gain access into the, sail communi the sailing community, so through the NSF process, we had to go out and find support from the different market segments. And we have a letter of support from the Wiley Design Group, which is a well-recognized sustainable sailing group out of the Bay Area. And when we presented to them our idea, they were very excited and they committed to helping us get through the distribution channels that they have access to. So that will be our way to get into the sailing community. And then with, those money, with that money, we can then gain traction to approach irrigation districts. We have reached out to a community up in Alaska, the Yakutat community. They rely 100% on diesel generators, and they're very excited about the potential that our system will offer. So we've already reached out to various individuals that exist in the markets that we're after. We have a letter of support from a group that works with uh, First Nation communities in Chile. They're also very excited about the potential that our system offers to those communities. So, so we're, we're, we're gaining traction already with the various market segments that we're after. Congratulations on that. Audience, do you have any questions? If you do, raise your hands. If you're in the lower level, up on the balcony, there's a microphone over in that corner. You'll have to go uh, over to there to get that. Yes, sir. So I'm going to do a two for, um, so first question, can multiple turbine blades be basically arrayed to one generator? And secondly, can you talk a little bit about unit costs and payback periods? So the beauty of this biomimetic design is that, so I was, I showed you some results from computational fluid dynamics modeling. So this thing is 
inspired by nature. So the streamlined design that is used is something that we see in the galaxy, we see in vortices, we see it in seashells. And what we're finding is that the turbulence that gets induced by the presence of this rotor is minimized. So that helps to array these things closer one to the other. They would not be feeding all to one generator due to the, the nature of the flexible tether. They'd be going to separate generators. But in comparison to other technologies that exist that are larger, they're more, they induce higher levels of turbulence. Those arrays have to be set up one farther from the other. So the footprint of our system to be able to generate more power would be smaller. And then we are, if projections work out well, we will be coming out with a system that's gonna be about 3,500 bucks per kilowatt to begin with. And that puts us at a very competitive range against other technologies. That's great, thank you. I have a question. So if you win, how will you invest the 17,500 from Ben Broadband Business? And uh, to what extent do you have uh, access to additional non-dilutive grants to continue your research? So the money from this award will certainly go towards the efforts that are gonna, re that are gonna be required to reach out to either agricultural co-ops or irrigation districts here in Central Oregon. Our intentions are to make Bend our headquarter and we wanna make sure that our first pilot demonstration project happens here. So reaching out to these different entities requires effort, and that to some extent requires money. And grants? So grants, I mean, we have NSF money right now. Um, we are, you know, there's different competitions that sometimes come around that we go after, but there's you know, nothing in the near horizon at the moment. Well, congratulations on the grants. It's a great way to move your company forward. Uh, panel, other questions? Come on, Adam, you're my, you're my question guy. Oh, is it? Excellent. From the balcony. I love balcony questions. Go ahead, sir. All right, so we're uh, pretty fish friendly in Oregon, and our current hydro system is not that fish friendly. Can you talk a little bit more about the debris and the fish friendly you've got on your slide there and how this works as it relates to fish migration? So, our rotor at 500 watts, 20 inches only rotates at peak efficiency at roughly 200 RPM. That's really slow. And all the studies that have been done up until now show that at that velocity, if for some reason there was an impact, it wouldn't do any harm to an aquatic animal. But the other thing that the studies have been showing is that the presence of a rotor in the water it emits a pressure fluctuation, and these animals are very smart. They've been around for a long time. They can sense that pressure, and they actually move around. To give you some numbers, these studies are showing survivability rates greater than 96%. So we really have, we're pretty confident that the presence of one of these in the water will not interact in a negative way with marine life. And then also because of that slow speed, the relative velocity between the rotor and any debris that's going by is really slow, so there's enough time, and the open design will allow for debris to go and flow past it. We did open water testing in Tomales Bay down in California, and all the sea there was no seaweed at all that got caught into our, to our rotor. So. Very nice job, congratulations. Let's thank Muriel. Thank you, sir. Good job. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Thank you. Next up on stage, I'm delighted to welcome Talina Barker of Mission Limelight. Mission Limelight will help thousands of charities to raise more money and achieve their charitable goals. And I had the opportunity to learn from Talina that she's actually gone skiing with Duke Hazard from the Dukes of Hazard, actually Luke Duke from the Dukes of Hazard TV show. <laughs> so welcome to the stage. Get comfortable. You'll have about three minutes for your pitch, and by about I mean three minutes. <laughs> uh, there will be a clock here. Pay attention if you can. If Kay. you don't, I will. No pressure. All right. Good luck. Sounds good. Thank you. Hi everyone. Yeah, oh. Thank you. What if you could invest in a company that also made the world 
a better place. Mission Limelight makes nonprofits more profitable and drives greater business impact. My name is Talina Barker. I've been fundraising for 15 years, having raised millions of dollars for charities, and we started Mission Limelight because we know the challenges faced by charities and donors alike. The nonprofit market is bigger than you think, and it's ripe for investment. There are 1.5 million nonprofits in the US holding 300,000 auction events each year. Those events raise $18 billion. In 2016, Americans gave $390 billion to charity. Here are the key challenges with auction-based events. Auction donations from local donors go for less than value because they aren't new or unique to the audience. Those audiences quickly lose interest, which results in decreased attendance, decreased revenue. Donors aren't getting new or strategic market to support their brand. And when their donations go for less than value, it's not just discouraging to the donors, it's actually harmful to their brand. These same donors are lacking the data they need to drive a truly effective giving strategy. Our solutions, we're ready to tackle these challenges. Our solutions operate on our Mission Limelight engagement platform, which is highly scalable, and it helps nonprofits capture more revenue for their cause by powering more powerful auction lineups and helps businesses measure and manage their giving, dovetail those corporate social responsibility and marketing goals, reach new audiences, and generate greater impact from their giving. Our solutions help from top to bottom. Our Mission Limelight Exchange is our first solution on the platform, and it's launched in live as of, as of about three weeks ago. Charities upload those local auction packages to the exchange and then trade for other packages across the nation, anywhere. Think about a Ben nonprofit trading a Tethero auction package with an Austin nonprofit for a South by Southwest Music Weekend. Both charities are going to raise more money and they're going to get their donors exposure in a new audience that they didn't have before. For businesses, we help them manage and fulfill that sea of donation requests they receive every single year, get new brand exposure, and measure and talk about the impact of their giving with our Connect and Marketplace solutions. We know that talking about giving is an important sales strategy. We're set for significant profitability with a scalable SaaS model. We project $10 million in revenue by the year 2020 if we implement just our exchange solution alone. And if we're able to implement all solutions on the platform, we project about $35 million over the next five years. Our team is fantastic. We have experts in both SaaS high growth technology companies and in nonprofit fundraising. We do have competition, but our exchange solution is completely disruptive. Thank you so much. Thank you, and right on time. Wonderfully done. Panel? Thank you. Cool. Um, thanks for the presentation. Thanks. Um, so it looks like you launched in September. Is that correct? We did. We launched okay. in the middle of September. So can you give us a little bit of insight as to how that's going? And then I also wanted to dive into the financials that you provided and understand how you expect to get to 37% of your TAM in five years? Yeah, that's a good question. So our um, adoption so far, we have 15 nonprofits that we've brought on in the, in the last uh, three weeks since we've been live. Um, we are continuing to reach out to nonprofits and we're just starting to implement our early adopter plan, which brings nonprofits into the system for a reduced rate with the understanding that our inventory at this moment is pretty low and it's the inventory that's going to trigger the effect that we need to really build the marketplace. My question relates to your expenditures. Uh, so for 2018, uh, we're looking at over $2 million. Can you talk a little bit about your, some of those expenses? Yeah, so what we're looking at primarily for 2018 is strong sales and marketing efforts to build the exchange platform. We know once we have a critical mass of nonprofits out there building data that's going to be valuable, as we implement and roll in the solutions for, for businesses, they're going to have more data to drive some of their strategic marketing and corporate, so uh, corporate social responsibility goals. And just to follow up on that, yeah. how are you marketing? What are some of the... Our go-to-market strategy for exchange in particular, we've identified 20 key markets across the nation where we're, we've put an ambassador in each area and we're beginning to reach out. We know that this has to be a geographically diverse play or it's not going to be exciting. It can't be a Ben-centric um, platform. So as we reach out there, we also have a number of nonprofits are, um, they come together a number of times a year, and we plan to go and be in those places where they are and present the product live, let them touch and feel it and join. 
I'd like to understand um, your, your sales process, sales cycle, and also um, what the onboarding process looks like for new customers and then customer retention as well. How do you, how do you keep uh, nonprofits? How, how using? do you keep them happy and yeah. staying in the system? So the first, the way we bring them on, and just to go back to those financial projections, when we're talking about revenue, we expect about 30% of our revenue to come from nonprofits. In our pricing structure, it's a tiered subscription service. It's an annual subscription service. And they get different levels of, of support and access to the system depending on their tier. The entry point for nonprofits is pretty low. It's $199 to $499 a year. Um, for the business cycle, we're looking at a minimum of $1,000 a year up to, with enterprise solutions like a Safeway Play, we're going to be looking at probably $30,000 a year for that. Onboarding the clients, especially for exchange, is pretty simple. We've got tools online that help educate them about what we're doing. The price point is low. They register online. They instantly have access to the system. They're able to go into the system and look at inventory and get a feel for it without paying. But once the payment's made in the system, they're completely on board. Any questions from our audience, including the balcony? I saw a hand back there, and one in front of her as well. Wonderful. <laughs> Good catch. Um, so you mentioned that you have competitors. What is it that differentiates your platform from your competitors? That's a great question. So with the Limelight Exchange, there's nobody actually doing that. If nonprofits aren't able to spice up their auction lineup, what they do now is they go out and they purchase auction package at market value, which takes which is part of the reason that I started Mission Limelight. It really bothered me when a nonprofit had to go out and spend four or five thousand dollars for an auction package to excite their donor, which then just took that money out of play. That was money they could have captured in another way. Um, on the business side, we have a few competitors. Um, Versaic in particular, they're focused on enterprise companies like JetBlue, uh, Fred Meyer, big corporate across the board plays. And their solutions, it's like $20,000 to onboard with them, and then another $40,000 a year to maintain the system. And it's not a 360 degree system where they've got data that's captured and in informing decisions between nonprofits, their activities, their sales um, results, and then the businesses and how they inform their decision making. I think I saw another hand in the audience. To catch this early. Um, I job, and uh, I was just wondering if you could elaborate a, little more on, um, elaborate a little bit more on the business side of it and why this is good for them. Well, in addition to, so if you get an auction donation request, it takes you about 15 minutes on average to evaluate that. Think about, and that's not fulfillment. So as a business, if you're getting 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, uh, think about the number Alaska Airlines get. You're having multiple staff members just to be able to manage that flow. It takes about 15 minutes to, to decide. And so we can come in and we can help reduce overhead. So that's a valuable dis dis business decision for them. But also really being able to tell the story about how you impact the world. We know that 87% of Americans, all options being equal, if one of those businesses can talk about how they have an impact in the world, 87% of people will choose that. And businesses are missing out on that opportunity. Great, thank you. I'm curious, if you win this competition, how will you use the 17500 from Ben Broadband's uh, services uh, to advance your business? That's a really good question. So what we need right now primarily is adoption of the exchange platform. So 100% of those funds, if we were lucky enough to win, would be targeted to adoption. Great. Other questions from the panel? Yeah, so congratulations on getting this far with 50K raised. Thank it's you. Impressive. Um, what it, uh, your sheet here says that you guys are looking to raise an additional 300. Where does that get you? So that gets us, again, additional adoption and traction out in the existing market for exchange. The next product we're being, bringing online is called a marketplace. And that's where, let's say, you're a boutique hotel and you're new. And you're, let's say you're advertising in 10 different markets around the country. You could take packages and put them directly into the marketplace for nonprofits who meet your giving criteria and your marketing, marketing criteria. So let's say, for instance, you're, you, you're advertising in Nashville and it, you've got a direct flight. You might say, hey, here's an awesome package for a nonprofit in Nashville that meets my, my heartstring pull, that also has doctors in an audience with at least 300 people and all those demographic information we capture from nonprofits as they come into the system. So it's another brand new marketing channel for them that doesn't exist now. Just sales and product. Yeah, okay. exactly. Cool.
Talina, what's your background and how did you get interested in this space? Well, that, so I've been fundraising for 15 years. And before that, I was actually a lobbyist. And a long time ago, back when my husband, who's out here somewhere, was in law school, I actually worked for a startup company in the dot-com boom down in Silicon Valley. And we got $1.7 million in financing for a B2B product, and it imploded like so many. But being the first employee and going through that entire process was exciting. Fearful, scary, but exciting. And so when we had the opportunity to launch Mission Limelight, I felt like I had a little bit of understanding about what we were getting into, and I was ready to do it. Sounds great. Any other questions? Oh, there we go. Up in the balcony, sir. Talina, Dave DeRose, Kid Center board member. Thank you for everything you've done for Kid Center over the Thanks. last couple of years. Um, I'm curious if uh, advertising or data is something that comes into the, the later revenue model. Absolutely. We haven't quite figured out. Nonprofits are an interesting, as you know, Dave, being on the board of directors for a nonprofit. Um, they're an interesting group. And th we haven't quite figured if we're going to advertise directly on our site to them because it, it, it kind of crosses a comfort barrier for them. But the data is definitely important. And on the business side, using that data to inform businesses about where to place their money, their gifts, their donations, their sponsorships is valuable. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions from the audience or panel? Oh, right here. <laughs> Talk loud, I can hear you. If you ask your question, I'll endeavor to repeat it. I can hear you. Uh, auctions, other than just enjoying the spot when I go to them. Yeah. Um, how much does a charity make on the auction item? Yeah, it's actually, so the question was, at an auction event, is most of the money being raised through the auction items or through ticket prices or what? And the price... With, with a good event where you've really engaged your audience, the primary revenue stream should be coming from that paddle raise, which is just when you give from your heart at whatever level is comfortable for you. After that is the auction lineup. Ticket prices typically don't even cover the cost of the event. Yeah. Talina, in the remaining seconds, what's the last thing you want to say to help us remember what a great company you have? Uh, we're just so excited about being able to bring this product to set charities up for being more successful. I have a passion. I mean, I've been working with nonprofits for so long, and watching them be successful is just encouraging to me. Our team, they all feel the same way. We're here to change the world, and we hope you'll join us. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Selena. Great job. So next up in the early stage competition stage is Matt Smith from Tribe Pilot. Tribe Pilot has launched. They're in business today. They're on a mission to help you have more fun with your friends in the outdoors. You know, come on out. Come on out. So, you know, there are many challenging challenges facing any early stage company. Some companies have founder issues. This company's founders all met in elementary school at the Pilot Elementary School here in Bend. Friends for life, so no founder issues here. Junior high. Oh, okay, well, that w it was close. Anyway, <laughs> hey, thanks for keeping me honest and accurate. So the clock is there. You'll have three minutes. Uh, everybody welcome Matt. And good luck. It's now time for me to sing It Isn't Unusual by Tom Jones. <laughs> but I don't want to see a mass race for the exits. Yes, you are. We'll get it figured out. Thank you, Matt. Hi, I'm Matt Smith, and I'm the founder of Tribe Pilot. Every year, I go on dozens of adventures. Oh, no, guys. I need my slides. No, no, no. He'll get his full three minutes. There we go. I go on dozens of adventures with family and friends. And so this is everything from a backcountry mountain biking trip to a camping trip with my friends and my family and maybe a gaggle of kids running around. 
Attached to each one of these trips is a trip plan that usually consists of dozens of emails plus of the details of the trip. And these details inherently get shuffled amongst all the banter of the trip going back and forth. At Tribe Pilot, we've created a tool to not only fix this problem, but make it a more immersive, fun experience for you to get together with your friends and family on fun adventures. Let me show you how it works. First, create a trip. Name the trip and upload your hero photo. This is an advertisement for your friends to come hang out with you. Now invite in everybody you want to come, and you can vote on a date and collaborate on a location. Organize the food on a day-by-day, -day, meal meal-by-meal basis, and then assign out things and let people tell you what they're making. Both personal and group pack listing allows you to organize the gear and to-dos for the trip. Chat right through our window, and then at the end of the trip, gather up everybody's photos into one central location and store it as a memory. Lastly, not depicted here, you can split up the trip costs fairly and evenly amongst the members and pay your buddy the $20 you owe him for the campsite right through the app with the touch of a button. But we do tack on 50 cents to that transaction. Additionally, every user gets 500 megabytes of free storage for their photos and videos, but if they exceed that, we do charge a fee. The market, half of all Americans participate in some kind of outdoor activity every year. This results in 11.7 billion trips into the outdoors, according to the Outdoor Research Foundation. However, we're focused on those 50 million Americans that go into the woods every year and spend the night. To reach these, our friends at Cairn are helping us out. We launched this week on both iOS and Android, and we're landing on the doorsteps of thousands of Americans across the country. Through this campaign, we expect to get between five and 10,000 downloads, and we're gonna use those users through the end of the year to iterate the product into the best possible form so that next summer, you guys have an experience that's great when you plan all your adventures. In winter this year, we're gonna be implementing co-promotional campaigns with major brands to spread the word, as well as partner with digital companies in the outdoor space. By spring, we're gonna have our business metrics dialed, we're gonna have our user metrics locked in, and we'll be looking for our first equity financing. Thank you, I'm Matt Smith, I'm the founder of Tribe Pilot. Vote for fun. Matt, awesome job, right on time, love it. <laughs> Panel, questions for Matt. Great presentation, thanks Matt. Um, my first question is on the business model and exactly how you guys will scalably make money moving forward. So I know in your, uh, your write-up you talk about a one-time fee and not using recurring revenue. Can you just talk about why you guys went down that road and uh, what that means for the company? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we actually have recurring revenue and it's based on a trip-by-trip -trip basis. So this transaction fee to reimburse your friend if you have five people on a trip and they all need to exchange money, maybe three out of five of those, um, and we're collecting 50 cents on each one of the, those. So our tools, you know, it's not just reimburse your buddy like a Venmo would do. You know, we actually add a, put a value add on there, which is that math that figures out who owes wh who what when, you know, maybe 12 different mm -hmm. transactions happen in some kind of very complex Venn diagram. Um, so that's kind of our recurring revenue. And then photo storage is that stacks, you know, th those come in a little bit later in, in, the, in the platform. And then later on, we're uh, looking at more of the business to business from uh, you know, an adventure planning company as well as uh, what we do extremely well is um, collect metrics on our users. So we're gathering what they're doing, what they're bringing, where they're going, when they're going, and what they're doing while they're there. Um, so we gather map pins across the United States of gearless and packless and foodless and what that trip costs and what they were doing. And uh, we think we can monetize on that later. At the moment though, it's about user scale and gathering that data. Do you plan to stay focused on the outdoor market or are there other applications, other markets? Yeah, the outdoor market has some clear channels that we know. Um, but no, not at all. We, we work really well anytime that there's a group of people getting together at a remote location. 
So that could be, you know, a family vacation. That could be, uh, you know, a girl's trip to the beach or a guy's trip into the mountains. Um, so all markets are open to us. You know, what we do really well is, is collaborate the group travel aspect from a planning perspective, not from a booking perspective like, you know, some of the other travel adventure companies do. Uh, I have a couple questions. So I'm asking as a, as a potential user because I have lived this pain point. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Do you or will you, I assume you'll integrate with uh, Gmail at some point so that I can add it to my, my Google Calendar? Um, any potential Venmo integration so that I can facilitate transactions through Venmo if I'm utilizing that platform for, for payment. And then the last question I have is in regards to um, providing me with recommendations of things to do or places to go after I've gone on a trip through your guys' app. Will you guys at some point make those recommendations and try and monetize those recommendations? Three great questions. I'll see if I can remember them all. <laughs> Venmo integration, we do integrate with third party. We do not touch your credit card info. We don't want to get into that space. Um, it's not Venmo uh, at the moment because they don't love to integrate with third party apps. Um, but it's going to be a similar, similar experience. Um, question one was integrate with calendars. So yeah, that's on the roadmap. That's probably in our very next feature set. Just add it to your, to your Google Calendar or your Microsoft, whatever that may be. Um, and then for recommendations, there's a lot of companies out there doing this discovery aspect, the outdoor projects of the world, the um, out, you know, there's, there's five or six out there that are all kind of competing for this discovery phase. Uh, so we're purposely staying out of that. We look at those people as partners. They provide that, aha, I want to do this. We'd love to see a button on their site that says, I'll download these details into Tribe Pilot, and now I can invite my friends and go on the adventure. Um, that aside, though, we do have a social aspect where you can see what your friends are up to and what adventures they're going on. So that's really how we handle Discover, is what are your buddies doing? And you know you can duplicate their trips and do them yourself. Nice, Matt, tell us about your co-founders, your team, and what each of them bring to your, your uh, company. <laughs> nice, it has to be fun. Uh, yeah, so, you know, we have a small, passionate team of people that grew up in Bend that are passionate about the outdoors. So, uh, you know, the, the, the skills are in admin, in a little bit of QA and quality, as well as um, business development. So, you know, we're, we're still looking to round out the team a little bit more from the technical standpoint. And that's probably going to be something we're actively pursuing over the next quite a few months. Thank you. I see a questioner up in the balcony. Thank you. My questions revolve around compatibility and uh, accessibility for your customers and integration as well. First off, uh, you mentioned you have uh, both an Apple and an Android launch. Is the app compatible across both of those? Can I talk to my friends with an iPhone with an Android? OK. And then secondly, have you thought about integrating with anything like outdoor project or places where people are looking to find those travel in the first place? Do you have any contacts with them, any partnerships with uh, websites like that that already plan that travel? Yeah, so first question, we do integrate across platform. I think that was your question, is that mm -hmm. correct? So Androids talk to iOS, talks to Android, talks to iOS, no problem there. Um, outdoor project, yeah, I mean, they're, you know, square in our target for funneling users towards us. We have had quite a few conversations with them. I can't really discuss any of it right now, so we're, we're that's, our, that's our spring plan. We're gonna build that out, you know, Right now, we're focused on iterate, iterations of the project that make it the best tool for you guys to use next summer, planning your adventures. Um, coming into f uh, winter this year, we're looking to grow. And then come spring, when, we, when all of you, hopefully, start planning your adventures and inviting all your friends, you know, that's really going to show us what kind of viral growth curve we have. Um, because there is that viral component. You can't go on a, on a group trip by yourself. I have a quick question. Uh, roughly what percent of your revenues do you expect to come from those transaction fees versus data storage? Uh, at the moment, so we're self-funded. And the reason we're doing that is we're, we're self-funding through a lot of these answers. Um, I expect about 50% right now. Uh, but coming into this winter, we're going to you know, start collecting some ski trips and things like that. And we're going to really be able to put pen to paper on what those numbers are 
Um, so I can ask, answer that more intelligently when we go out for our equity financing round. I think I saw some audience questions. Uh, so I just kind of uh, was, was wondering, um, you had obviously talked about uh, some photo storage opportunities. Uh, it seems like that would be a great platform to go ahead and have everybody who went on a trip access um, the photos that everybody else took. Um, I'm just kind of curious uh, how you're going to try to go ahead and push using your platform as opposed to all the other photo sharing opportunities that certainly many users would have um, already uh, that expand beyond, you know, um, planning trips. Right, so there's no reason people can't store their photos somewhere else. What we do really well is package it up as a memory that includes, you know, all the rest of the trip plan along with those photos. So, you know, what we're looking for is, you know, a history of your entire life's trips and adventures all in one location. You know, it's not going to be integrated with, you know, the selfie you took at the bar last night. It's going to be your, your fun, your action, your adventures your trips with friends and family is all in you know, a photo album containing memories attached to your pack list and you know, the banter back and forth, maybe some fun chats that went on, is all in one location for you. All right, well, he, he took a lot of my question. But um, so is that 500 megabyte limit on a per trip basis or is that an overall for your account? Because 500 megabytes uh, in the days when most smartphone cameras got 12, pix 12 megapixels, that, that's, that's not a lot of space. Yeah, so that's, that's through your account. Um, so photos and videos are, are direct cost, right? The storage of those. Um, so if people get you know, takes a bunch of 5K videos and start uploading them to our site, we're either going to have to charge more or start compressing. Um, and, and we'd love to, to give you full access to those images, but to do so, you know, we got to monetize on it somehow. Matt, in your last 30 seconds, if you win, how will you invest the $17,500? Yes, yeah, so $17,500 is huge for a self-funded startup. You know, that goes right towards progress. And we're going to use that to make it through spring. Not that we won't make it without it. Um, that's going to give us horsepower to get through spring and to that equity financing where we can, you know, really steepen the growth curve with uh, some outside funding. Nice job. Thank you very much. Give them a round of applause. All right, next up are Kent Sheridan and Nick Humbo of Voila Coffee. Voila makes amazing coffees available for all of our busy lives, and they plan to revolutionize specialty coffee. I also learned recently that Nick is an Eagle Scout, and this is a question not for our Q&A period, but maybe back in the lobby. Uh, Kent may or may not have gotten married on a reality TV show. So welcome to the stage, guys. As you get, Are you going to make me coffee? We are, actually. Oh, you, you rock. Thank you. Um, you got my vote. No, I can't say that. Everybody's wonderful. Um, so the way this works is a clock over there. Once you get started, you'll have three minutes for your pitch, and then we'll do some questions and answers. Sounds so great. off you go. Good luck. Thank you. Hey, I'm Kent Sheridan, the founder of Voila. And I'm Nick Hombo, the co-founder and sous chef at Voila. And we make instant coffee better than anyone has ever done before. We make instant coffee that is going to make you sorry you ever hated on instant coffee. It's incredible and probably better than the coffee you're drinking now. But where the heck did we come up with such a wild idea as good instant coffee? Well, I was pretty tired of bringing a backpack full of brewing equipment whenever I was away from home or didn't have a great cafe nearby. This mess was not working. And I had gone the opposite route and used to choke down cups of instant sludge just so I could wake up on the way to Mount Bachelor. I was sick and tired of drinking Grandma's Folgers Instant. With Voila, you can not only have incredible coffee anywhere and anytime, you get to discover exciting new coffees and roasters. Best of all, it's ready in seconds, just add water. There's a place for Voila in every coffee drinker's life. You're running out the door, you're staying up all night practicing your pitch, you're camping, you're snowed in, you're flying out at 5 a.m. Whatever the situation, voila, will be there for you. 
We are already partnered with 10 of some of the best roasters in the U.S., and so many more are begging to be involved. We brew their coffees up to near-perfect extraction, so they taste exactly how they should. We then process that liquid coffee in our proprietary methods that we've spent over a year inventing and fine-tuning to create the perfect single-serving packet of dry instant coffee that can preserve the freshness for over 25 years. This is completely different than any other product that's on the market right now. Once we launch November 1st, customers will be able to visit our website, voila.coffee, select how many cups they would like, customize their taste preferences, and then receive incredible specialty instant delivered monthly. The market for Voila is massive. Back in 2016, the specialty coffee market in the U.S. alone was $43 billion. And not that it's a good thing, but a study shows that millennials are actually spending more money on coffee than they're putting into their retirement plans. Cha-ching! The former VP of Stumptown Coffee, Eric Haste, sought us out as the next big thing to happen in the industry and most recently joined Voila as an awesome strategic investor. We've been featured in the New York Times, Huffington Post, NPR's How I Built This, and many more. We have an incredible product and brand that connects with consumers, and we are about to revolutionize the specialty coffee industry. If you think this won't happen, then you haven't tried Voila. Remember the first time you ever heard of craft beer? Well, you'll look back at this and remember it as the first time you ever heard of specialty instant coffee. We honestly want to win the BVC to help pay back Nick's grandma a little bit, but mostly to help offset the build-out costs of our awesome new facility here in Bend. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, great job. Where's my coffee? Are our slides up? Yeah. So yeah, I got, I got well, to try this. Q&A, Nick's going to set up the panelists right, with so some voila actually, to make for themselves. Yeah. All right, well, I will, uh, I will kick it off. Thanks for the presentation, gentlemen. It was fun. Um, yeah, absolutely. So how are, you able, how are you able to produce more coffee more efficiently than your large competitors? So we're, we're not actually able to produce, produce more more efficiently, and that's part of why traditional instant has tasted so bad. We do have a balance that's made this process worthwhile and brought our costs down, but traditional instant coffee is brewed with hundreds of degrees of heat and pressure to create an efficient uh, substance that just tastes horrible. And so we take the approach of hitting those perfect extractions to where every coffee is accurately represented for, our, for the country of origin where it comes from and the roasters are proud. And yes, that does cut back on the efficiency of these huge big brands, but that's why you know, we're able to have the world's best instant coffee. <coughs> So your subscription model, um, do you intend then to be introducing instant coffee from all different craft brewers from all over the place? Um, yes. So like Kent said, uh, right now we're partnered with 10, 10 roasters, and we get emails every single day coming in that roaster, that, from roasters that really want to partner with us. Um, we absolutely need to nail down the subscription model first, but we have the opportunity to also Partner with hotels. Um, this is something that our roasters have already done. They have accounts with hotels and have asked us to take over the in-room coffee service. So imagine if you were staying here at the Oxford, and instead of walking in to find a Keurig machine and or you know, your old classic brewer, you had a pack of voila that was filled with local roasters that you get to carry with you throughout your entire stay and make it anywhere, anytime. Okay, don't shoot me, but you don't list uh, Starbucks Via as a competitor, so... Um, oh, what was up there? Oh, uh, in your packet. Oh, 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 okay. How much of... Um, can you tell us a little bit about what Starbucks Via is doing and how that relates to what you'll be doing? Sure, exactly. We don't see them as a clear, uh, direct competitor. Um, they've really uh, tried hard to create Starbucks Instant, and um, what they do, their process, really cuts corners um, for them to be able to mass produce that. And we feel that it's really fallen short. Um, we don't want to cut any corners with our product and feel that it rivals a fresh cup of coffee at some of your best cafes. And I don't think Starbucks could say the same. I have a question about um, supply chain. is often a hard nut to crack for these types of companies. Can you guys just extrapolate a little bit on your guys' understanding of how the supply chain works and 
how you guys get go through fulfillment, sure. actually get the product to my doorstep, et cetera. So it's, it's seamless, uh, essentially, for your customers? Yeah, sure. We actually have a really unique program. Because we uh, don't have to purchase coffee fresh roasted to order, there's about a four-week period where these great coffees will last before there's any degradation in quality. So we offer a zero-waste program for our roasters to give us and sell us a buyback or overstock coffee at a discount off wholesale, keeping our costs lower. And so we take in their roasted coffees, process it in our methods, and then we pack it and categorize it into three general categories. And so if you were to go on our website, you could either purchase a one-time pack to try, say, for last-minute orders or gifts, but you would also be able to subscribe and customize your taste preferences within three broad categories. And that would ship once a month to all of our subscribers. This is a good cup of coffee, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice I appreciate it. So uh, I'm curious, what's the value proposition for your roasters? So right now, um, our roasters get exposure not only on our website, they have a bio that will link out to their uh, shop if they have one. They also get exposure on our social media and on our packets. So if somebody tries coffee and we're sending it out to them, then, and they fall in love with that coffee, they can then go back to that roaster and say, wow, that was my favorite cup of coffee in my life. I want to buy more of that one. So we really love promoting and putting up uh, our roasters on a pedestal because it's really all about them and about their coffees. And that just allows us to siphon their brand equity and to really solidify the Voila brand. Nice. Questions from the audience? I see a bunch. Uh, we'll start up at the microphone in the balcony and then go from there. Oh, wow. All right. Um, so we were talking that uh, you actually need hot water, right? So we can walk around with it all day, but we need hot water. So the question is, can you eat it? Um, yes, you, you absolutely can eat it. It's very bitter. Um, and It needs to be diluted. Yeah, it needs to be diluted. You can make it hot. You can make it iced. You can make it as an espresso. You can add two ounces. You can even make what we like to call a voilate, uh, just adding steamed milk. And it's delicious either way you make it. Yeah, so that's the next question. Have you thought about cooking with it? What was that? Cooking. Have you thought about cooking with it? Um, we ha actually have. Uh, so I used to work at a really good restaurant called the Rainier Club in Seattle, and the chef is amazing. And one of the desserts that he's actually made has had little coffee grounds sprinkled on top. And I've actually emailed him, and he wants to maybe incorporate this into an ice cream and or a souffle or, you know, it's... Sky's the limit, honestly. Uh, there's a microphone up behind you, and then there was a question down here. Yeah, thank you. Um, so judging from the uh, judge's response, this is probably some of the world's best instant coffee. But when I asked just even the group around me, what do you, what's the first word you think of when you think instant coffee? Almost all the responses were not positive. And even you mentioned kind of the sludge when you were talking about it. How do you overcome that consumer negativity? Where, where does that come in? How do you basically convince them that instant coffee can be a gourmet product? Yeah, well, absolutely. You want to take it? Sure. Uh, okay. There's absolutely a negative connotation surrounding the word instant coffee. Um, that's definitely something that we are looking to change. Um, it, it's all about customer acquisition. One, you know, when we go to our go-to-market strategy is we are going to give this out to everybody. Uh, you know, we are going to convert customers by handing this out, Gorilla Street Marketing, offering one free cup on our website to anyone that is skeptical, and really just trying to change the minds and way people think of instant, because it really is where the future is gravitating towards. You know, we've seen cold brew, we've seen ready-to-drink coffees, that is one of the biggest markets in the coffee industry right now, and if, you know, good instant coffee is definitely kind of not really something that people will actually believe in unless they try it. Okay, up, thank you. Up in the balcony. Tell us a little bit about the price point. Sure. So our price point starts at $4 per cup. And uh, that really sits right in line with specialty pricing, so it's understandable if you're not exactly used to that uh, $4 price tag. But actually, uh, it's, you can liken it to paying 6 to $8 for craft beer. 
The prices and specialty are going up and up, and $4 sits right in line with the average price you would pay for a great pour over in a cafe. So our customers are already accustomed to that. And with quantity, our pricing goes down to $3. And this is all a breakdown per cup delivered. And actually, Acorns Money Matters uh, did a study and found out that millennials, on average, already pay $3 every day on coffee. Also, just to kind of validi give some validity to our price, uh, one of the main competitors in this space is called Sudden Coffee. They're based out of San Francisco. <coughs> And they launched back in August of 2016, and they started out at $6 a cup and sold out month after month after month after month. After running for about a year, they've been able to get their price down to around $3, $2.78, $2.3, $2 $3, depending on what type of coffee they have on hand. So that's kind of where we're going to be starting, and then with growth, we obviously want to be able to drop the price. Blue Box question. Hi, you've broken down your cost as uh, per cup. So how much is the actual subscription model? I'm asking for a friend. Sure. So the breakdown for the subscription model, um, it starts at that $4 per cup if you were to just get one pack delivered. Um, and then as it goes, we have a 10, 15, and a 30 cup. And by the time you get to 30 cups, you're saving $30. So it's real, real savings and real incentive there. And that's all delivered to your door anywhere in the U.S. In and you can split it with your friends. Too. Yes. In your final 18 seconds now, how will you use the 17500 if you win? Well, uh, we are building out our facility right now. We actually cut concrete yesterday. And there are a few different things with our packaging that we need to figure out. And we really, really, really need a printer to actually help us print on the actual pouches themselves versus hand labeling everything. That's something that we still need to overcome. A great job and a great cup of coffee. Give Thank them, you. Give these guys a hand. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. All right, one more to go. Next up, we're going to have Rick Lee and Adam Allen of Wildish on stage. Wildish makes outdoorsy gear for outdoorsy people. They had a successful Kickstarter uh, earlier this year. It will be shipping product in March. And we have a jam up here. As they're getting set up, please welcome Rick and Adam to the stage. It's all working. Your clock is over there. Three minutes. Are you guys ready? Okay. Actually, you can hold the mic to each other. These guys can your improvise mic on the fly. Hello? Wow. There, there we, we go. go. Let's give a hand to the sound guy. I'll use this. It's coming off. It's good. Okay. Is it good? Oh, now I'm on. Okay, great. Hello? All right. All right. Dude, there's a lot of investors here. Are you sure you want to do this? Good morning, everybody. We're Wildish, makers of outdoorsy gear. My name is Rick. I'm the nerdy digital marketing search and rescue guy. Yeah, he's crazy nerdy. Hey, guys, my name's Adam. I'm the design mountain bike guy. Did y'all know there is a huge difference between outdoor people and outdoorsy people? There sure is. For example, outdoor people go whitewater kayaking, backpacking for days, and prioritize trainings, whereas outdoorsy people go floating the river, hiking with beers, and prioritize hanging with friends. Right. Outdoorsy people sound pretty incredible. Now, let's see what they're using for gear. Outdoor people use gear like... Things with spikes, technical apparel, wintertime pooper scoopers, weird. Okay, now let's see what outdoorsy people are using for gear. Indoor, outdoor puffy blankets, beautifully designed camp chairs, wireless rugged speakers. Rick, I'm loving this outdoorsy gear category. 
I am too. Um, the problem is, is there's a lot of companies making outdoor gear for extreme athletes, but only a few making outdoorsy gear for the rest of us. So we saw a need in the market for more outdoorsy gear. We did, but we wanted to make sure. So we did some research, and as it turns out, the market's big. It's $887 billion spent annually. 150 spent right here in the Pacific region. So there was a need. The market is huge. So we launched Wildish, makers of outdoorsy gear. We sure did. So we started looking a little bit deeper into the business model of outdoorsy gear companies, and we learned that they focus on playful design, micro innovations, lean manufacturing, and of course, crowdfunding, which allows them to lower their risk and build a community at the same time. So we took everything we learned, and we went to Kickstarter, and we funded our first piece of outdoorsy gear. You guys, this is the MC Hammy. So we went to Kickstarter and we raised nearly $20,000 to fund this thing. We built a new community of over 10,000 new Wildish followers. We got covered on Outside Magazine, Gear Junkie, and Digital Trends, just to name a few. And, um, okay, so here it is. We're going to need our hands, so I don't know how this is going to work, but we weren't sure what we want to do, so we just made it do all the things. So we made it waterproof and huge, so it can be a giant ground blanket for groups. But also, we added loop and cord so it could be hung as a rain or sun shelter. But best of all, we built in the straps. That way, it easily converts into an oversized double hammock. Pretty sweet. So in conclusion, guys, we are epically smart geniuses. Oh, well, Adam, oh. let's do a recap first. So to recap, Bend is the epicenter of the outdoorsy gear community. Wildish is leading the, or pioneering the outdoorsy gear category. This sounds like a match made in heaven. Match made in heaven, guys. Thank you so much. We're just, just getting started, so we appreciate your support. This is Rick. I'm Adam. We are Wildish. Thank you so much. You, All right, so questions from our panel. All right, thanks again, guys. Um, so real quick, in your write-up, you talk about uh, helping other uh, outdoorsy gear companies e-tail their products on your website. Can you talk a little bit about how you get to that point and build your brand? Sure. Um, so our focus is, is bringing outdoorsy gear to the market. Um, there are definitely some other brands that are in the kind of playful outdoor space. So specifically with products that we never plan on making, for example, speakers. Making speakers is really hard. There's a lot of companies that make very good speakers. Um, so we've partnered with Outdoor Tech to actually sell their speaker on our site. So where it makes sense, we're bringing complementary products to kind of, you know, fill out the store and allow people to, to add things to their cart, essentially. Obviously, the brand um, is very fun. Uh, do you think you would ever do, you know, go beyond e-tailing and have a bricks and mortar location? That would be phase three. Okay. <laughs> um, phase one is, is definitely direct to consumer. Um, that, that's where we really want to connect with our customers for sure to begin with. Uh, phase two would be expanding into retail in general. Um, even early on in, in phase one, we're going to toy around with some pop-up shops because that's, that's a lot easier, more cost effective. Um, and then phase three, if, if we can really hammer this drum of outdoorsy gear and, and build a community around it, sure, we, we'd be open to the idea of retail stores. One more question. Will your own products complement the other products you're selling, the other outdoorsy products, or vice versa? Uh, well, they'll complement each other. Ultimately, right? are you going to get most of your sales from other uh, products or from your own? Uh, good question. We, we don't know. Okay. Um, I mean, we're, we just got two new products on the market on the website last week. Um, we're doing drink tanks here locally, and we're doing outdoor tech with our speaker. Um, we're gonna be launching the MC Hammy in November. It's gonna be for sale, so just in time for Christmas, and we'll see what the market wants. Yeah, so, so the idea of bringing in other outdoorsy gear companies is that way it's a nicer shopping experience, and this is more cohesive, because people really understand, right, when we start pulling things out of the box, that, okay, cool, there's a clear distinction between the two categories. Um, and so then there's opportunity for marketing, cross-promotion, upsells, things like that. And, and that way we can just get, we're not so focused on just getting more gear out, right? So it's just not nice to come to a site and you see like one product in two colorways. So that way it's just a nicer experience. You guys already, you ran a Kickstarter campaign, correct? Can you talk about what you guys learned from 
people that purchased the product through the Kickstarter campaign, demographics, where they were buying from, et cetera? Um, so we sort of resonated, I mean, you can tell with the fun branding that we're resonating with kind of a younger crowd. Um, we saw a lot of people actually in the Southeast, uh, and we've talked to people after the fact, after the Kickstarter, and, and we kind of realized, you know, there's not a lot of chances even to do extreme activities in the Southeast, right? Like, they just don't have the Rocky Mountains, they don't have the Cascades. Um, so, so we think that that's going to be a, a really hotbed for us. People like to be outside down there, but they, they don't do extreme things, so they're definitely outdoorsy. Um, and the demographic skewed young. Uh, we're really looking forward to getting the MC Hammy in their hands uh, next month and then get some feedback. Yeah, so it would appear, because it's fun and playful and super colorful, that it does skew young, but we are getting some really great feedback from all sorts of age groups, right? Um, people are coming up just really resonating with the new outdoorsy gear philosophy. So. How much do you charge your tarp thing for? So it's not a tarp thing. It's called the MC Hammy, just yeah, so everybody yeah, yeah, remembers okay. that. It let, is me, let me rephrase the question. <laughs> <laughs> Great. MC Hammy. The blue one goes for uh, $99. And do you have the colorways? So we have two more colorways that we're really excited about. Um, this one is called Tropical and the other one is called Crackle, and they sell for $119. they are a little bit more expensive because printing on that large of a piece of fabric definitely has some costs. Not to scale. Not to scale. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I will buy one. Nice job. Um, you've gotten some great coverage in the media. What's your plan to continue getting media coverage and to leverage that for customer acquisition? Yeah, so I think uh, moving forward, we really need to get as many people as possible to really connect with the outdoorsy gear philosophy. And so it's kind of like reaching out to influencers, running social media campaigns, really collaborating with other outdoorsy gears, like, like I said, for cross promotion. Um, Rick and I are talking about this winter, doing a campus tour, kind of getting out there, doing a modified kind of pitch to college students and yeah, seeing what kind of people want to get together and just getting feedback. Um, so we got tons of ideas, right? It's just a matter of, is there enough time and money to kind of implement them? Sure, questions from our audience, right down here. Have you considered getting MC Hammer to be your pitch band and make a killer viral video? <laughs> <laughs> we have definitely considered that. If anybody knows MC Hammer, <laughs> put us in touch. Other questions from the audience? Right Panel? Oh, great, one down here. Uh, do you intend to build a community, uh, kind of like a chive thing with wildish outdoor events and things like that? Yeah, good question. Um, we're actually having our very first event here in Bend in November. It's gonna be called Outdoorsy Days, and it's gonna highlight a, a few local retailers. It's basically gonna be a scavenger hunt through town and through the park. Um, that way people are kind of getting outside, you know, on a Sunday when it's maybe a little bit cold and, uh, you know, winter's setting in, try to get out and have fun. There's going to be a lot of selfies. It's going to be great. <laughs> Question in the balcony. So if I could rephrase the question, the mic was a little quiet there. The question is, with other companies in the market, how will you gain traction and uh, maintain momentum? Yeah, there's, a lot, there's tons of outdoor companies, right? Everybody knows that. Um, Polar, everybody asks the question, how are you guys going to compete against Polar? Um, we're really not here to compete against Polar. Really, we're here just to build our own brand, our own product offerings, to be different and build that community um, of outdoorsy people. And when they get the brand, Hopefully, you know, they'll be down to connect and use our products in a fun way, so. If you win, how will you use the 17,500? Is that me? Yeah, so like I said, we, uh, we have a pretty heavy road ahead for getting out and beating this outdoorsy gear drum. Um, it's a very new category, so the idea is to get out, do cross promotions, hit the road. Um, it'd be fantastic to, you know, hire some freelancers to help us along the way. Um, but it's really, it's all about pushing and getting some dollars in the door by selling these, uh, this new product. Other questions from our audience? Good catch. Um, so you guys probably are aware that a shopping experience is mostly online for a lot of folks these days. Uh, 
social promotions work really great, uh, Facebook, yeah, blah, 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 but a very major percentage of session traffic comes through organic search, which leads to a really high ad spend. Um, tell me more about your guys' strategy to place well in Google in a very populated category, because if you search for outdoors, you're gonna hit outdoor, and if you search for MC Hammy, you're gonna hit hammock. Oh, that's funny. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that, that's actually why we want to go direct to consumer, because if we're selling direct, then we have quite a bit of margin on this product to actually spell, spend with advertising. Um, you know, if, if you're going to the retailer, you're just expecting them to tell your story. We think we can tell that story a lot better ourselves, capturing the eyeballs with a beautiful image of an outdoorsy person and an outdoor person. People come through, we have the sales funnel of learning about what that means. We're hoping to identify with the customer. And then at the bottom, you know, we're, we're selling products, outdoorsy products. Um, so that, that's definitely the focus. So we are certainly prepared to pay for clicks. And really, you have to do that with Kickstarter even. Um, so we have some experience doing that. I have some digital marketing background, so we're super excited to get into the market and start cranking on the advertising for sure. Yeah, once these things, yeah, once these things land, guys, we're ready to go. We're, uh, we've been in a dead zone for quite some time waiting on prototypes and prototypes. So uh, we're pretty excited to get this thing out and start selling it. We have 40 seconds for one more question. I have a question. Um, are you already profitable? Okay. Yeah, so we like to say we break even every month. Um, Rick and I are able to feed ourselves, so we are full time on this thing. Um, the dollars do trickle in, uh, but we're really hoping as this thing lands and we get out there and we can start executing, that we'll be more profitable. You know, within next year, next summer, it can be huge for us. I just wanted to uh, say that the reason we're breaking even is because we actually already have a product in the market. It's called the Mr. Big Stuff. And this is a kind of oversized beach blanket slash adventure blanket. It's good for the park. It's definitely not waterproof. Don't take it in the rain. But it's great on dry ground. Um, and so we sell these through Amazon and through our web store as well. Thank you guys for a great presentation.